Are you preparing for your HESI A2 entrance exam and you need a little bit of help with the reading section? Do you need to practice some concepts like main subjects, topic sentences, evaluating sources, and author's purpose? Well, I'm here to help. Hi, I'm Liz with SmartEditionAcademy.com, and in today's video, we're going to go over a realistic A2 reading practice test together. So to follow along with me, please click the link in the description below for access to the free test. Together, we'll look at each passage, question, and the answer choices and review why the correct answer is correct. Before we get started, click the link in the description below for all our online resources, like our study group for the HESI or our self-guided course, which has interactive questions, practice tests, videos, flashcards, and many more resources for your HESI entrance exam. So let's start our practice test one, reading comprehension for the HESI. All right, question one, let's scroll down. What is the most likely purpose of a popular science book describing recent advances in genetics? Let's look at our answer choices. To decide, well, we don't really see anything about a decision. We don't see a choice between two things or multiple things. That's not mentioned here, so I don't really like that answer. To inform, so we see it's a science book. There's recent advances in genetics, so we have scientific information and facts about genetics. So that's definitely some good information for us. Let's keep that one. To persuade. Well, it just says describing recent advances. So it doesn't say convincing people that recent advances are good or bad. We don't have any element of trying to push our opinion in one way or the other. Let's get rid of that one. To entertain. Maybe this is not a terrible answer because we do say it's a popular science book, so it's not a textbook. But if we think about entertainment, we're going to think often about storytelling, humor. We don't see really any evidence of that here. So the better answer is to inform. All right, we have our first passage here. So let's read that text. Wisewear gear provides you with cutting edge technology to enhance your performance and optimize your training. Wisewear products include sensors to track your heart rate, activity level, and calorie burn during workouts. Information is automatically uploaded to your phone and organized so you can track your improvement over time with just a tap of the screen. Concerned about comfort? We've got you covered. Wisewear clothing is made with high-tech synthetic compression fabrics to promote circulation and wick away sweat while you work out. Top-level pro athletes like ultramarathoner Yuri Schmidt rely on Wisewear for training and competition. Shouldn't you do the same? So the purpose of this passage is to, we actually have the same options, but let's go through one by one, to decide. So again, decision would probably ha give us multiple options or at least two options. Here we don't have, you know, Wisewear versus Adidas, something like that. We don't have options to decide. So let's get rid of that one. To inform... Well, we do get information about their product, but at the same time, it's quite different from the last one where we had scientific facts. This is not really, you know, information so much as advertising. They're saying, we've got you covered. So we know it's written by the Wiseware people. Maybe the information is not reliable. Next one is Persuade. Okay, so it's written by these people. It's really an advertising feel. It feels like a commercial or a print ad. And they say top level athletes rely on Wisewear. Shouldn't you do the same? So they're addressing the person reading it and kind of pushing them, pressuring them to, to buy the product. So, so persuade is a good answer. And entertain. So again, with entertain, we would be looking for storytelling. We would be looking for humor. We don't see that here. So let's go with persuade. Next one about the same passage, Wisewear. With which statement would the author of this passage most likely agree? Americans who work out put too much emphasis on performance and not enough on enjoyment. Okay, well, we don't see anything about Americans specifically, so we don't actually know who they're, they're talking to or about. Um, we see cutting edge technology to enhance your performance. So we probably wouldn't say they put too much emphasis on performance. They mention performance as something people want. Second choice, people who do not buy high-end exercise gear do not deserve to get a good workout and stay healthy. 
Well, I don't see any evidence here. I mean, they are promoting high-end exercise gear, but they don't say that people who don't have it don't don't deserve to stay healthy. They say an ultra marathoner uses it, but they don't say anything about people who who don't buy it. So let's stay away from that one. I don't see any connection with the passage. The best way to achieve a healthy body is to follow a simple exercise plan and avoid hyped up gadgets. Okay, so would the people writing this agree with that? Probably not because they're trying to sell you a a gadget, something very high tech. They say cutting edge technology, sensors to track your heart rate, uploaded to your phone. So they're trying to sell you a gadget so they wouldn't agree that you don't need a gadget. And the last one, consumers want help pushing their bodies to the limit and gathering information about their exercise performance. So that seems like the best one so far. Let's always try to find some proof in the passage. So with these, you want to be able to point to the passage and say, I saw this phrase, I saw this sentence, I saw this statistic, and that's why I chose this answer. That's why this answer is right. So pushing their bodies to the limit, gathering information. So we see cutting edge technology to enhance your performance, optimize your training. So push that training and that performance further. And then we have information. So information is automatically uploaded to your phone. So gathering information, that fits. So that really fits with the passage. Let's go with that one. Okay, so on our same passage here, which detail from the passage, if true, is factual? Wiseware transforms the user into a better and more informed athlete. So we're talking about factual here. We're talking about facts, something we can prove, something that you can't argue with. It's scientific. It's a statistic. We can prove it. So here they're saying a better athlete, more informed athlete, especially more informed, it's hard to measure. That would be more my opinion about the person. So anything that's descriptive, we want to be careful and factual. I don't like descriptive words. Wise wear gear is the most comfortable exercise clothing on the market. So again, we're really in in descriptive mode here because to me, maybe my sweatshirt is the most comfortable And to someone else, their fleece is the most comfortable. So that's really subjective. It's not a fact. Wisewear products contain sensors that track the user's body signals. Okay, so this would be something we could prove. We could just hold it up, say, here's the sensor. Okay, so we can prove that. That is factual. Let's just take a look at the last one, just in case. Wisewear users are expected to improve at their sport over time. So we can't really prove that because it's an expectation and it hasn't happened yet. It's in the future. So we can't prove that and say it's a fact. So let's stick to the third one here. All right, with our Wiseware continued, the author of the passage includes details about Wiseware's comfort and ease of use in order to appeal to the reader's reason. Well, you know, the reason, usually you would appeal to reason more with statistics, with scientific facts, so that doesn't really fit with with this part about comfort and ease of use, so let's get rid of that one. Trust, do we see anything about trust? Mm, Usually when we're talking about trust, maybe you'd see, say our company has been here for 100 years, or maybe this doctor said this was good for your health, or this dentist said this toothpaste was great. So we don't really see that here. We see the ultra marathoner, but that's that's kind of a different, different thing. So I wouldn't say trust. Feelings. Well, this one, we actually see something. So we say, why is where's comfort? They ask concerned about comfort. So are you concerned? Are you worried about comfort? And they say, we've got you covered. So they're kind of trying to to reassure you. Oh, will I feel comfortable in this? Yes, you will. Don't worry about it. So that's appealing to feelings. So let's keep that one. And knowledge. Again, they, they tell us about the product. So we have products knowledge, but knowledge in terms of what exercise does for the heart or why people should exercise for many decades or any kind of broader knowledge, it's not there. So it's really better to say feelings because we see that concern and we see the ad reassuring us. So feelings. Okay. The author most likely includes the detail about a famous ultra marathoner in order to make readers. Okay. So we looked at this a little bit. We saw at the last sentence, top level pro athletes like ultra marathoner Yuri Schmidt rely on Wiseware for training and competition. Shouldn't you do the same? So let's take a look at the answers here. Understand that Wiseware gear is factually the best on the market. Okay. Again, again, 
always careful about factual. A fact is something we can prove. There's often a statistic or something scientific or something we can see, touch, prove ourselves. So just someone using it, well, maybe it's a fact that he uses it, if we can prove that, but it's not a fact about, about the, the performance of the product. So it's not factually the best. Let's get rid of that. Take a weak position when they attempt to argue against the point. So to make readers take a weak position, we don't really see the ad arguing with readers. I mean, that's a strange word. It doesn't fit with, with the passage. We don't see readers arguing that Wiseware is, is bad. So let's get rid of that one. It doesn't seem relevant. Trust that scientists have really studied Wiseware gear and proven it worthy. Well, the detail about an ultra marathoner, and then the answer says a scientist. So that person, unless it's something they don't mention, in which case is not in the passage anyway, this person is a marathoner, not a scientist. That's not relevant. Next one, feel an association between Wiseware products and a person they admire. Okay, so we do see top level, pro athlete, ultra marathoner, and these are people who like running. So this could be a person they admire. So let's, let's go with that one. A global temperature change of a few degrees is more significant than it may seem at first glance. This is not merely a change in weather in any one location. Rather, it is an average change in temperatures around the entire surface of the planet. It takes a vast amount of heat energy to warm every part of our world, including oceans, air, and land, by even a tiny measurable amount. Moreover, relatively small changes in the Earth's surface temperatures have historically caused enormous changes in climate. In the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, when much of the northern hemisphere was buried under huge sheets of ice, mean global, mean global temperatures were only about 5 degrees Celsius lower than they are now. Scientists predict a temperature rise of 2 to 6 degrees Celsius by 2100. What if this causes similarly drastic changes to the world we call home? Which sentence is the topic sentence? So a topic sentence to review is a sentence that expresses an idea. So it's going to be an idea that the rest of the paragraph will try to prove or will give facts to support that idea. So we want something that's general but kind of has an opinion to it. So let's take a look. What if this causes similarly drastic changes to the world we call home? Well, already that's the, that's the last sentence, which generally in a good paragraph is not the topic sentence. But just to be careful, we're not really using this as a topic sentence because it's a question. So it's kind of asking the reader to consider, but it's not giving a statement or giving an opinion to support afterwards. Next one, a global temperature change of a few degrees is more significant than it may seem at first glance. Okay, so very good one. So we see that this comes up, well, it's the first sentence. So sometimes the first sentence is a topic sentence, not always, so do be careful. But we see this small temperature change and the big significance, the big effect throughout because we say, oh, the ice age, it was only a small change, but it had a big effect, these huge sheets of ice. So everything that comes after that is connected to it and supports it. So that's a good candidate for topic sentence. It takes a vast amount of heat energy to warm every part of our world, including oceans, air, and land by even a tiny measurable amount. So this is connected to the topic. So we're talking about heat energy and temperature change, but it's not general enough. It's talking about the oceans and the air and the land and the scientific process of heating it up. But the previous one is better because it's generally saying there's a small temperature change that has a big effect. So that one's a better topic sentence because it's more general. Next one, in the last ice age 20,000 years ago, when much of the northern hemisphere was buried under huge sheets of ice, mean global temperatures were only about 5 degrees Celsius lower than they are now. So for a topic sentence, it's rare to see these specific things, 20,000 years ago, 5 degrees Celsius. So those will often be more supporting details than topic sentences. Not 100% of the time, but it's a good clue that these specific statistics, numbers, dates, those are usually more in supporting detail. So let's stick with our second answer. That seemed like the best one. In the paragraph above, same paragraph, global temperature change is the topic, 
Well, it, it is the topic, it is the subject, it is the, the idea that we're talking about, all these different sentences connect back to, so that's a good option. The main idea. So the difference between the topic and the main idea. So the main idea will also have more of an opinion or an assertion or a result or something you could debate against. So here they're saying, you know, that the small temperature changes have a big effect. So they're not just saying global temperature change because that's not that's not a main idea. It's not something we could argue for or against. So that would be more a topic. The supporting detail. So again, as we saw, supporting detail should have some more specific things. And this is actually really, really general global temperature change. It's more like a topic. The topic sentence. The topic sentence is a sentence that expresses that main idea, that argument, that thing we can say we're for or against, we agree or disagree, that global temperature change has a big effect. So that would be the, the topic sentence, which we've already found before it has, it has more to it. So let's go with topic, really general, just the subject we're talking about, global temperature change. Which sentence summarizes the main idea of the paragraph? Okay, so the main idea we saw too is, you know, the, the main argument of the paragraph or something that we could argue before or against and everything in the, in the paragraph is connected to this. A small change in weather at any one location is a serious problem. So I actually remember something, so let's go back and look. So this is not merely a change in weather in any one location. Okay, so it's not just about one location. So let's get rid of that one. We're talking about the whole earth, not just one location. The author is manipulating facts to make global warming sound scary. Hmm. Manipulating facts. I mean, we see facts. Ice age was 20,000 years ago. There was a difference of five degrees Celsius. We don't see any evidence of them manipulating facts. And we can't see that here unless they give us, give us more that's in front of us. So we, we don't see them manipulating. People should be concerned by even minor global temperature changes. So yeah, we do see that the, the topic sentence, that the global temperature change of a few degrees is more significant than, than it may seem, meaning it has a big impact, big consequences. And they're saying, you know, huge sheets of ice in the past because of temperature change. And they're saying that enormous changes in climate have happened historically. So that's something to, to think about, that a small Small change has a big effect. That's the idea we've been going, going on about in these past few questions. It takes an enormous amount of energy to warm the earth even a little. As we said before, that's part of our scientific explanation of temperature change, but it's not the main idea of the impact this change will have. So let's stick with number three here and go on to the next one. What function does the information about temperature differences in the last ice age play in the paragraph? So that information, let's go back and just check it again. In the last ice age 20,000 years ago, when much of the Northern Hemisphere was buried under huge sheets of ice, mean global temperatures were only about five degrees Celsius lower than they were now. So we always go back and check what they're referring to to see it in the context, to see the full, full information there. So is it the topic? Well, no, we said the topic is very general global temperature change. So that's not the last ice age 20,000 years ago. No. Opinion. This isn't an opinion. This is historical or scientific fact. So it's not their opinion. Oh, the last ice age was terrible. That's an opinion. That's not this. Main idea. So this is not the main idea. As we said, the small temperature change with big effect, that's our main idea. Supporting detail, what we see 20,000 years ago, that's a, that's a time, that's a date. We see five degrees Celsius, that's a statistic. So those are some clues, not always 100%, but those are some, some clues that we might have a supporting detail. It's very specific, and that's what makes the supporting detail. Which sentence would best function as a supporting detail in this paragraph? Well, supporting detail we talked about. So what are we going to look for? We're going to look for something specific that has a connection and it proves our idea that small temperature changes have big effects. So electricity and heat production create one quarter of all carbon emissions globally. Did we see anything about carbon emissions in here? Nothing at all. 
So let's get rid of that because it's not connected. And this is a good point because the test will try to trick you because in your head, if you think about all the information you read in the world and the newspaper and here on TV, you think, oh, carbon emissions and climate change, they're connected to each other. But really when we're in the test, we need to be in this passage. We need to be focused on the text in front of us and we need to react to what they give us. So we kind of need to shut out the other information from newspaper or TV, something like that. So let's focus on that. So this is not relevant to our text. The world was only about one degree cooler during the Little Ice Age from 1700 to 1850. So that's that's pretty good. That's specific. We have a degree. We have dates, which is just like another supporting detail we saw in the in the paragraph. And it also proves our idea that a small temperature change has a big impact because it can, can create a little ice age. That's a big impact for one degree cooler. Next choice, China has surpassed the United States as the single largest producer of carbon emissions, surpassed, gone beyond the U.S., gone more than them. But again, carbon emissions, that's not our subject here. So let's get rid of it right away. Methane emissions are in some ways more concerning than carbon dioxide emissions. Well, we don't see methane in the paragraph. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about these emissions. So let's get rid of that. And let's stick with the most relevant one, actually the only, only relevant one in this case, which makes our life easy. And let's go on. So a new sentence here, read the sentence below and answer the following question. Numerous robotic missions to Mars have revealed tantalizing evidence of a planet that may once have been capable of supporting life. Imagine the sentence is a supporting detail in a well-developed paragraph. Which of the following sentences would best function as a topic sentence? So we have Mars may have once had life and this is supposed to be a supporting detail. Okay, so first choice, Venus is an intensely hot planet surrounded by clouds full of drops of sulfuric acid. Well, we have sentence about Mars, potential answer about Venus, not relevant here. Of all the destinations within human reach, Mars is the planet most similar to Earth. Okay, so if this was a topic sentence, and then they said Mars may have once had life, well, we know Earth has life because we're here right now. So that's a, that's a connection there. That, I like that as a possibility. Next one, liquid water, a necessary ingredient of life, may once have flowed on the planet's surface. So this one, it is connected, it can be connected, but it's even more specific than the one we see here. So we want the other sentence to be more general because we're looking for the topic sentence, which is more general than supporting detail. So this one is connected, but it's not the best option. Space research is a costly, frivolous exercise that brings no clear benefit to people on main Earth. Okay, well, you know, this is not really going with the same tone of this paragraph. I mean, Mars tantalizing evidence, maybe there was life on Mars, and then someone says, this is all a waste of money. We don't really see this in the, in the same paragraph, so let's get rid of that one, and let's keep this one here, number two. Imagine this sentence is the topic sentence of a well-developed paragraph. Okay, so before we needed that Mars may have had life, that was our supporting detail. So that was a bit more the specific thing. And now it's a topic sentence. So this we're going to see is more general and we need to find something maybe more specific. Which of the following sentences would best function as a supporting detail? Yes, so we're looking for more specific than Mars maybe had life once. Of all the destinations within human reach, Mars is the planet most similar to Earth. Okay, so we saw these answers. These answers look familiar. So we chose that one as a more general theme last time. So we're not going to choose it as something more specific. So let's get rid of that one. Venus is an intensely hot planet surrounded by clouds full of drops of sulfuric acid. So Venus, again, not relevant. We're talking about Mars here. So let's get rid of that. Space research is costly, frivolous exercise that brings no clear benefit to people on Earth. Again, this is not as relevant and connected as the other options, so let's get rid of that. And liquid water, a necessary ingredient of life, may once have flowed on the planet's surface. As we said before, this is more specific than Mars may have had life, so this is a great supporting detail to the, to the statement that Mars may have had life. So let's go with that one. Next one, how could this sentence function as a supporting detail in a persuasive text arguing that space research is worth the expense and effort because it teaches us more about Earth and ourselves? 
Whew. So let's take a deep breath here because we've gone from this is the supporting detail, this is the topic sentence, this is the supporting detail. So what are we even looking at here? Let's take a minute to slow down and read carefully. So how could this sentence function as a supporting detail in a persuasive text arguing that space research is worth the expense and effort? Let's take a look at our options. By using statistics to back up an argument that needs support to be believed. Well, if this is our supporting detail above here, we don't have statistics. I mean, we say numerous robotic missions, but that's not 65% of missions or that's not 55% of Mars had this. So we don't see statistics here. So let's get rid of that one. By showing how a space discovery could earn money for investors here on Earth, mm, no, no money in this sentence. They're not saying, oh, we can sell seats on the space shuttle or we can sell souvenirs of Mars. We don't see any connection with money. Let's get rid of that. By providing an example of a space discovery that enhances our understanding of life. So definitely, I mean, this is tantalizing evidence. This is an exciting discovery that maybe there was life on Mars. So that's enhancing, it's improving, it's expanding our understanding of life. That's definitely true. And that would be a reason for space research to be a good idea, to be worth the expense and effort. Next one, by developing the main idea that no space discovery can reveal information about Earth. Well, we just mentioned Mars, but we don't necessarily rule out Earth. And if we're saying no space discovery can reveal information about Earth, that's not a good argument for, for why we should invest in space research. So that wouldn't go together. That answer doesn't even go with the question. So let's get rid of that one. I will choose number three. So we've got a new passage here, something different, different topic. The idea of raising children in prison is controversial, but well-run prison nursery programs can actually be beneficial. A study of preschool age children showed that anxiety and depression are common among young children who are separated from their mothers at birth and reunited later. In contrast, babies who spent brief sentences of two years or less behind bars with their mothers showed greater resilience and stronger attachments. According to a nationwide analysis of women who participated in prison nursery programs, the benefits for mothers are even clearer than the benefits to children. Women who were allowed to remain with their infants during prison sentences were less likely to be convicted of another crime and less likely to use drugs in the five years after release. They were more likely to continue their education in prison and more likely to find employment on the outside. Mothers involved in prison nursery programs also reported better mental health and greater confidence in their own parenting skills. Let's look at our question. Which statement expresses an opinion? So remember, we, we always have to differentiate between opinions and facts. So opinion is something that I believe or my friend believes, but maybe someone else doesn't. And then the facts will be something we can prove with statistics, scientific studies. So here we're looking for opinion more personal and subjective. So a study of preschool age children showed that anxiety and depression are common among young children who are separated from their mothers at birth and reunited later. So a study showed, that's a research study, that's something we can prove, so that's not an opinion. The idea of raising children in prison is controversial, but well-run prison nursery programs can actually be beneficial. So saying these programs benefit people, that would be an opinion. So I could say that other people think they don't benefit people, there's another solution that's a better option. So this one's subjective, let's keep that. Mothers involved in prison nursery programs also reported better mental health and greater confidence in their own parenting skills. So we're saying what the mothers reported. We're not saying whether it's good or bad or we think they were right. It's just saying what they reported. So we can prove that they reported that. We can look at the research study. It's not an opinion. Women who were allowed to remain with their infants during prison sentences were less likely to be convicted of another crime and less likely to use drugs after release. So again, this is part of the study. So this can be proven. We can see the statistics they probably have about the probability and how many people were convicted, how many people weren't. It's not an opinion. So let's stick with this one. On to the next, also about this prison paragraph. Consider the following sentence from the passage. Mothers involved in prison nursery programs also reported better mental health and greater confidence in their own parenting skills. Is this statement a fact or an opinion? Why? Well, we actually just discussed this a little bit as one of the potential answers. 
an opinion because it shares information about confidence, which is an emotion. So we're not saying here, I am confident or, you know, the president is very confident. That would be an opinion, but they're saying mothers reported greater confidence. So it's not an opinion. A fact because it states verifiable information about how women reported they felt. Exactly. So we can verify, we can check the information. We can take out that scientific study and say, what did they say? Mm, what did they say? Well, let's check it. Let's verify it. Good option. A fact because it focuses on information from medical records rather than faulty memories. Well, we don't see faulty memories or medical records mentioned here. This is, this is not relevant. Let's get rid of this. An opinion because it replies on, relies on human input rather than objective sources like computer records. Well, we've already said it's not an opinion. The mothers reported this, so it's not an opinion. Let's get rid of that. All right, it's verifiable. We can check and verify it. Next question about the same passage. What is the primary argument of the passage? Young children should not be forced to live in prisons. So is the passage trying to argue, trying to convince us that this is true? Well, let's take a look. They're saying babies who spent brief sentences behind bars showed greater resilience. So they're not trying to argue that. That's not their point. That's not what they're trying to convince us of. Get rid of that one. Society must promote the health and safety of children. Well, that is part of it. I mean, we're looking at their resilience and their attachments. Um, but it, it's quite general if we're talking about this passage. It's not health and safety of all children. It's these specific children in this context. So I don't love the answer. Maybe we're not ready to cross it out yet. Let's take a look at the next one. Letting imprisoned mothers keep their babies can be helpful. Well, this is the, the topic we're talking about, imprisoned mothers. And can it be helpful? Well, we see up here the better mental health, confidence in their parenting skills, as we saw for the babies, greater resilience. So that's really good. And it's, it's more relevant to this passage than number two. It is bad for children, but good for mothers if children live in prison. So we see two paragraphs and both of them say that the babies and mothers being together in prison is good. So they're saying babies, greater resilience. And for mothers, it's good. For babies, it's good. So this is not the argument that it's bad. So let's keep number three then. On to the next question. What is one assumption behind the passage? So with an assumption, it's something that's not stated in the passage, but something that the author had in mind before they started writing. So let's take a look and see if we, we see anything that fits that description. Imprisoned mothers should take parenting classes to learn how to raise children. So I don't think we see anything about parenting classes. We see parenting skills. We don't see parenting classes, so I don't really see that relevant. Let's cross it out. Some people disagree with the idea of allowing mothers to raise children in prison. So we actually see this, and I remember, let's scroll up and take a look. The idea of raising children in prison is controversial. That means someone is against it. But is this an assumption? No, because the author is stating it in the paragraph. It's in the paragraph. So it's not an assumption. An assumption is something we, we think without explicitly saying it. The needs of incarcerated mothers are more important than the needs of their babies. Mm -hmm. Do we see that kind of influence of the author's opinion on here? Well, the author is talking about benefits to babies and mothers. So I don't really see the author before they start writing think, oh, this one's more important than this one. No, there's a paragraph about each. That's not the way the author is thinking. Next, society should protect the health and well-being of children born to incarcerated mothers. So was this what the author was thinking before they started to write? It could be because they start writing about the benefits for babies, benefits for mothers, and we don't really see anyone arguing against the, this idea here. So let's go with that one. Which sentence responding to the passage displays faulty reasoning? Hmm. Okay, so we're going to look for some errors in logic here, faulty reasoning, some problems with how people are, are forming their arguments. Although prison nursery programs have benefits, they do not justify the costs. So this is a different opinion from the one the author has, but we don't see faulty reasoning. Obviously, if this person wanted to continue with that argument, they would need to support it with evidence, but there's no faulty reasoning here. Let's look for something else. Putting babies in jail is wrong because people that young do not belong in prison. Hmm. So the because 
is actually the same as the first part. And this is something called circular reasoning or circular logic, where we go in a circle. We just start with something we assume, some kind of opinion that we don't explain or we don't prove, and then we use it to explain something else. If I say red dresses are beautiful because red is beautiful and dresses are beautiful. So red dresses are beautiful. Why? Because red is beautiful, dresses are beautiful. I'm going around in a circle and I'm never pulling in outside information that says 95% of people report an attraction to the color red. It's just me kind of jumping in there and starting something that goes in a circle. So babies are young, so they shouldn't be in prison. Why? Because they're young and young people shouldn't be in prison. It's circular logic, it is faulty reasoning. But let's check the other two just to be sure. Further research is necessary before it becomes a common practice to incarcerate babies. No faulty reasoning here. Of course, research is always good, further research is necessary. We see some research over here, some studies, but we can always add on more, that's not faulty reasoning. Society needs to find a better solution than prison for babies with incarcerated mothers. Again, this is someone with a different opinion than the author here, but that's not a faulty reasoning. That's just a different opinion. So here we have our circular logic. Let's go with that one. The paragraph in the passage about benefits to mothers contains faulty reasoning because it... Okay, so let's look at our paragraph again. So this was the second paragraph here, and they're talking about less likely to be convicted of another crime, less likely to use drugs, more likely to continue their education. So let's look at our answers about that paragraph. Suggests a cause and effect relationship without proving it. Hmm, Okay, so this is something about causation and correlation. So sometimes we say, you know, it's raining, and I did really well on my test. Well, even if that happens a lot, is there necessarily an effect that the rain has on you doing well in your test? Maybe if you prove that the rain makes you stay inside and your studying made you do well on the test, but if we just have two things and we can't prove a connection between them, that's not really a good argument. And here we're saying that um, women have these, you know, less likely to be convicted of another crime, less likely to use drugs, But we don't yet have in the paragraph anything says that it's because they were with their babies. So we have these two things that are associated, but is it necessarily a cause and effect? We don't have that proof. So let's keep that one. Causes readers to question the mother's mental health outcomes. I don't think readers are questioning. We don't have reason to to question. We say mothers reported better mental health. This is what they themselves said. So there's no reason to question. Does not prove factually that women in the program are better mothers. So we do have some confidence in their parenting skills, better mentor, mental health. So maybe these are the outcomes they, they want and they don't necessarily want people to, to be better mothers. Of course, better mothers is so objective. So how would we factually prove that? I mean, a better mother, some people think a strict mother is better. Some people think you know a relaxed mother is better. So it's hard to prove a better mother factually. Again, we talked about the the word fact and then these descriptive words like it's better, it's more comfortable, um, it's more beautiful. Those things don't really go together. Fails to show that it is beneficial to participate in prison education programs. Well, we see they're more likely to continue their education in prison, but we're not really talking about being beneficial. So that's not really relevant. That's not the point we're trying to prove. So let's go with number one. Read the following sentences. We must provide funding to expand prison nursery programs to serve all women who give birth in prison. To do otherwise would cause babies to suffer needlessly. Hmm, okay. So this is something we're going to see a lot where people set up this binary, this black and white, and they don't address the gray area in between. So this would be an ineffective conclusion to the passage above because... First choice, it uses circular reasoning. We saw that before, and that was, oh, red dresses are beautiful because red is beautiful. So this is not that. We have babies suffer needlessly or expand prison programs. So we have two extremes. We don't have a circle here. Next choice, it uses either or reasoning. So that is the name for this this technique, this logical fallacy, where we have two things set up. And it's not real. It's not the real situation. If I say to my mother, either you buy me a car or you don't love me. 
Well, that's setting up two things without recognizing all the truth in between. Maybe she says, I love you, but I can't afford to buy you a car. Maybe she says, I love you, but you're not ready for your own car. So that would be a problem because I'm I'm acting like there's just two options, but there's so many more. Here, there could be another type of program. There could be other family members who take care of the babies. There's many different types of options beyond baby suffering and expanding this program. There's many more options in the world than that. So this is a good either or is not effective. Its language includes insults. So are we insulting anyone here? I don't see any kind of insult. Mm, yeah, we, we're not insulting anyone, which is good. So eliminate that. Its language displays gender bias to serve all women who give birth in prison. So we don't see any assumptions about women or any assumptions about babies of a particular sex. So we don't see them saying, you know, because of their, their sex or gender, they're this way. So that would be gender bias. And we just don't see that here, just like we don't see insults. So eliminate those last two, either or reasoning, one of our logical fallacies. Which of the following is not clearly a form of faulty reasoning? So we're on the same topic we were just thinking about. Now we've moved away from the passage and we're just in our general knowledge. So all these topics that are general knowledge questions, you'll want to review. So which is not a form of faulty reasoning? First choice, either or fallacy. Well, we just went over that. That is faulty reasoning. So when we make it black and white, only two choices exist when that's not the reality. Cross that out. That is faulty reasoning. Circular reasoning, again, we saw we jump in with an assumption and then we use it to justify something else when we never prove the first thing and we go in a circle. So that's faulty reasoning, cross it out. And overgeneralization. So this is one we haven't seen yet on this test. What it means is you're using a few people or a small sample size to make a, a generalization that's not really true because you don't have enough data, you don't have enough people to support that idea. So if I say, oh, my friend with red hair loves chocolate ice cream. So all redheaded people love chocolate ice cream. Well, I only met this one person who that's true about. I haven't done a study. I haven't done scientific research. So that's an overgeneralization and it's not good reasoning. So that's another faulty reasoning. Let's get rid of it. A statement of opinion is the last one. So if I state my opinion, you know, I, I like chocolate ice cream, if that's my opinion, maybe you disagree, but it's not faulty reasoning. I say I like, so you know it's, it's just my opinion and it's subjective. So it's not faulty reasoning. Which is the best definition of the word argument in the context of reading and writing? So in the context of reading and writing. One, an eloquent summary. So a summary is recapping what we said. It's, you know, maybe a brief version of what we said throughout the paragraph. It's not an argument because an argument is trying to persuade us, trying to convince us, trying to make us think in one way. So it's not the summary. No. An angry conversation. So maybe this answer is interesting for you. And maybe in your own life, when you hear the word argument, you think, oh yeah, people are angry. Oh, my teacher had an argument with the principal or my friend had an argument with his neighbor. So in the context of your life, maybe that's what argument means. But here we say in the context of reading and writing. So careful, it's not the same thing. So let's get rid of that. Next one is a persuasive point in a text. So if we argue something, it's something that people can agree or disagree with. And that's why we write because we make a statement, we make the argument, and then we support it with those supporting details to try to convince people and, and get them over to our side and persuade them. So that's a really good option. Arguments are persuasive. The next one, an object or direct object phrase. This is a really general grammatical concept where we have the object is, for example, if I say, I like puppies, puppies are the object, I'm the subject, the verb is like, I like puppies. But I like puppies is not a persuasive point. Maybe if I said puppies are the best because they're so cute and they play with you, okay, that's more persuasive. But just saying, I like puppies, or I go to work, um, something very, very simple, a phrase is not an argument. We need an element of persuasiveness, convincing people. So we're going to go with persuasive.
You're all doing such a great job following along with this test, so great work practicing. And for more practice, don't forget to visit the link below and access our resources like our study group and our self-paced online course, which has some interactive questions, practice tests, videos, flashcards, all the resources you need for your HESI preparation. All right, let's jump back in. All right, so we're on to understanding primary sources, making inferences, and drawing conclusions. That's what we're going to address now, those primary, secondary sources, so maybe something to review. Which of the following could not be a primary source? An oil painting? Well, an oil painting is done by an artist, so if we're talking about something that Van Gogh painted, then his painting is a primary source. He did it himself. A personal email, again, this comes directly from that person, so it's a primary source. An autobiography, so autobiography is written by you yourself, so again, it's a primary source. An encyclopedia entry, so this is not written by the person. So if we go on Wikipedia and see about Van Gogh or we go in Encyclopedia Britannica, that's not directly coming from Van Gogh about himself. So let's go with that one. Which source would provide the most credible information to a researcher interested in studying changes in farming technology since the beginning of the millennium? So credible, we're looking for something we can trust. We can believe it. We think it's a good source with, with objective information and informed writing. The first one, a current advertising pamphlet produced by a tractor company. So if we look at advertising, a lot of times that won't be a credible source because the, the person has a goal of trying to get you to buy something. That, so they say, oh, our tractor equipment is the best in the world. Maybe it's not actually true, but they want you to buy. It's not credible. We can't really trust it. Let's cross that out. A recent post about a tractor accident on the blog Farmer Joe's Farm and Life. Well, a researcher studying technology and then a tractor accident, we don't know that that has a connection with, with technology. Um, they might write more about the accident and the medical part or a personal story. So that doesn't really help us here. Let's cross that one out. A book published in 1950 about improvements in farm equipment over time. Well, we're, we're trying to compare the past to the modern time and 1950 is not the modern time. So this is not as relevant to what we're doing. So get rid of that. A recent article, recent, comparing features of farm equipment in a journal for farm owners. So a journal for farm owners is credible because we have their writing about farming, they're experts on this topic. So that's something really good. And we have a recent article. So because we want to compare the past to now, that's also really great. That's a credible source. Which of the following is not, not a primary source on Charles Darwin? So remember, primary source comes from the person directly themselves. Charles Darwin's field notes from his travels, well, those come from him. Cross it out. It is a primary source. On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, he wrote that book. Cross it out. An online database of Charles Darwin's writings, well, of course, he wrote his writings. Let's cross it out. A blog post about Charles Darwin's contributions. Well, this guy was not blogging because he was alive before computers and he died before computers. So this was written by someone else and that makes it not primary source. So that's what we're looking for, not. A source is considered credible. Ooh, we saw this word before, if readers can. So if they can trust it, yes, this is what credible means. Let's check the others just to be sure and rule them out. Publish, if readers can publish it. Well, readers are not the ones publishing the source, maybe they publish something else on their own time, but they're reading the source. They're, they're, they're not the ones publishing it. It's the publisher. Analyze. Well, readers can analyze things that are credible, that are trustworthy, or that are not credible. They can analyze someone's argument, even if they don't agree. So that's not a credible source. So analyze and credible, it's not related. The same with decipher. If readers can understand something that's confusing, they can decipher it. They can manage to understand it. That isn't related to whether the source is trustworthy or not. So we're really looking at trust goes with credible. Which type of evidence would not be considered credible to back up arguments in a persuasive text? So the first choice, logic. 
So logic is credible. That's why we talked about those logical fallacies before. Those are not credible. But when we follow logical reasoning and we say this happens because of this and it's the consequence and it's a real cause and effect, that's a good argument. So it's not not credible. So we have to cross it out. Statistics. So statistics are credible. We talked about facts, things we can prove, scientific studies, 30% of something. These statistics, they are good arguments. So they're not not credible and we get rid of them. Scare tactics. <gasps> Halloween's coming up. So scare tactics. So scare tactics are when you try to persuade someone of something, but you're not using real information. You're trying to pressure them. For example, if someone is trying to sell you some camping equipment and they say, if you don't buy this tent, a bear will come and eat you. <gasps> you get scared and you want to buy it. But there's no, there's no logic there. There's no statistics. There's no science. They're just trying to scare you. So that's not credible. Let's keep that one. First-hand accounts. So first-hand means it's from the person directly. It's a primary source. And those are credible. So not credible. Scare tactics. What type of source is an online video of a conference presentation by a scientist reporting on the results of her research? So a scientist talking about her own research, something she did herself. So that's going to be primary. Blank, provide insight and commentary on the topic, but may also introduce biases or errors. So if we look at primary sources, those are not the insight or the commentary. If we look at Van Gogh's paintings or Harriet Tubman's letters, those are not the insight and commentary. They are the topic. So it's not primary sources. We're going to look at secondary sources. Those are ones that comment on something. For example, if you take the primary sources and you write a biography of Harriet Tubman, that's an example of a secondary source. But maybe the author is very biased. They have a certain opinion about all the actions she took. And so it's not as direct as her letters. It's a secondary source. Which sources are usually considered most trustworthy? So we want just the closest from the person directly, the words from their mouth or the data from their research or the notes from their observations. Those are primary sources. Now we have a passage. So let's take a read of this paragraph and look at the question. Read the passage below and answer the following question. Before I came to America, I couldn't have known how difficult it would be. I knew I would miss my mother and my friends and my language, but I didn't know I would have to scrabble so desperately for so long to earn my place. Even when I had managed to make a living, I overworked myself with an animal terror. When I left home, I thought I was leaving poverty behind, but eventually I came to understand that I had escaped physical poverty by stepping into a poverty of the soul. Which sequence accurately describes what happened first, second, and third in the passage? So let's go through these and check the order against the passage above. One, arriving in America. Two, overworking. Three, escaping poverty. So when they, when they arrive in America is really the moment when they escape the physical poverty that was in their last home. So I would, I would switch those two. So they escape the physical poverty upon their arrival, and then they start overworking. So those, those last two should be switched. I don't think this is the correct order. Let's eliminate. Number two, one, coming to America. Two, escaping physical poverty. Three, stepping into a poverty of the soul. So they say, I escaped physical poverty by stepping into a poverty of the soul. So they arrive in America. They come here. Once they're here, they have escaped the physical poverty from the home. But when they start overworking, they feel that poverty of the soul. So this is a good one, but let's check the others to be sure. One, knowing how difficult America would be. Hmm. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's go back to the, to the first sentence. Before I came to America, I couldn't. I couldn't have known how difficult it would be. So this is not even about the order being incorrect. This is factually in incorrect. They didn't know how difficult America would be. It wasn't even possible for them to know. I couldn't have known. Eliminate it. Next one, expecting to miss friends. Okay, they did expect to miss friends. Knowing how difficult America would be. We see the same thing. The first sentence contradicts this. So get rid of that. Let's go with number two. 
All right, so we're on to a new, we have a graphic here, actually, we have two graphics here, so something a little bit different for us. Study the graphic element and consider the summary below to answer the following question. A high school student is presenting research on how gender affects participation in her political science class. So we see here two graphic elements. Um, we have the pie chart, time spent speaking. We see female 30%, male 70%. And then we have the bar chart. So average number of times students are interrupted during class discussions arranged by gender. So we have number of times and then we have gender on the x-axis. So male, we see the number of times they are interrupted is three. Female, they are interrupted six times. Summary of the research. Following a month-long study of the participation levels in political science class 201, the results indicate that males speak for the majority of the time. 12 one-hour sessions took place over a course of a month. The professor lectured for approximately half the class. The professor is male, but the total time and subsequent questions taken during his lecture were subtracted to calculate the data. Only the time dedicated to post-lecture discussion was evaluated for creating the graphs and conclusion. As a result of the research, it would be recommended to host formal debate-styled conversations. However, it may be necessary to create some, if not very specific, limitations to prevent a filibuster effect. Someone talking for a long time. These limitations would allow for each debate party, whoever it may consist of, to share their opinions and pose questions to the professor and class. All right, down to our question. Male students spend blank of class time speaking. So we see all the options are percentages. So let's go look at our pie chart, which had percentages. So time spent speaking, 70%. So this one, I think we have some, some concrete information in this graph. So if we read the graph carefully, maybe we don't have to go through answer by answer as I usually recommend, but you could go through answer by answer to be extra careful. And what you would see is how is the question trying to trick you? Okay, we see three, where is three up here? Three is a number of times interrupted. So it's not a percent, so that's incorrect. Six is also number of times, it's not a percent. The only percents are in the time spent speaking and we're looking for the male, which is 70, not the 30%, which would represent female. Okay, our second question about this graphic. Which statement accurately describes the average number of interruptions during each class discussion? So let's look at our options. Male students are interrupted an average of six times. So is this true or false? Let's look up here. Number of times students are interrupted by gender, male, three. Okay, so that's not true. Female students are interrupted an average of six times. Let's take a look. Students are interrupted, female six times. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty good. Male students interrupt others an average of three times. Okay, a little bit interesting because they're changing the wording, but this wording doesn't go with our chart wording. So students are interrupted, so that doesn't match. And we'll see actually the last one too. Female students interrupt others. That's not what our chart is about. Our chart is who is interrupted by others. So we're going to go with the female students six times. General question here, a blank restates the main idea of a text in different words, attributing the ideas to the author. So a summary, well, yeah, when we summarize something, I mean, we do restate the idea, we use some different words, we rephrase it, we summarize it, we recap it, so that's a good option. Sequence, in a sequence, we're talking about order, there's usually a step one, step two, step three, and we don't see any kind of indication of order here, so I would eliminate that. Topic sentence, so restates the main idea. Well, actually the topic sentence states the main idea. So the topic sentence is gonna be earlier in the paragraph. It's not a restatement in different words, it's the statement in the original words. So that's not, not correct, no. Graphic element, well, we just saw in the past question, we saw a bar chart, we saw, we saw a pie chart. But here we're saying in different words. So we're using words, not graphics. So that's going to be summary. And now back to our graphic elements here, our pie chart and our bar chart. So which argument does the information in the graphs best support? So for a little refresher, we have males speaking 70% of the time. We have males interrupted only three times versus females interrupted six times. So female students do not have as many ideas about political science as male students. 
So we don't see anything about ideas here. We're talking about speaking. Someone can have amazing ideas in their house, head and they don't speak them out loud. So let's eliminate this one. We're not talking about ideas in these graphs. The class should make a greater effort to give students of both genders a fair chance to speak. Okay, so it doesn't really look fair here. If we look at these two's bars, if we look at this pie chart, these don't look fair. They don't look equal. So that could be something good. Contrary to popular belief, male students face greater gender discrimination in school settings. Well, at least in this class, I mean, we have males are only interrupted half as much as females. So that is not proven by these elements. There is no substantial difference between male and females class participation in discussions. Well, is it a substantial difference? I mean, three versus six, six is twice as much. And then 70% is more than twice 30%. So this is a really big difference. If one statistic is twice the other, for me, that's a big difference. It is, it is substantial. So cross that one out. The class should make greater effort to give students of both genders a fair chance to speak. Okay, so we have a different type of graphic here. We're looking at a flow chart, which is something that goes in a sequence, step one, step two. We have some different options. So we see start, look in the kitchen, want to eat any of this stuff, can you afford to eat out? If not, go look in the kitchen, if yes, eat. Um, so we, depending on the steps, we might go in a different order. Let's take a look at the question. What is the first thing the chart asks you to do if you are hungry? Okay, so let's go to the beginning, the first thing. So I'm hungry, me too, I understand. Start, okay, start, look in the kitchen, look in the kitchen. Okay, so look in the kitchen. So we see these other options. With these charts, it's pretty clear that, that you know, when we see the answer, we find it. If you have the time and you wanna be extra sure, you could eliminate other things by looking at the sequence. For example, we see eat is the last one at the bottom, so we would cross that out, so it's not the first thing. We would see consider whether you can afford to eat out or consider whether you want to eat what you have. We can see that those are also lower down, so they're further in the sequence. So we can eliminate those by saying they come after our answer of look in the kitchen. But with the graphics, you're pretty sure that you have a concrete proof that your answer is correct. Next question about the flow chart. According to the flow chart, what do you need to do if you cannot afford to eat out? Okay, so let's go back here. So he said, look in the kitchen, want to eat any of this stuff? No. Can you afford to eat out? So according to this question, we cannot. So no, we're gonna go back up, look in the kitchen. So do we have any answers connected to the kitchen? Grow a garden? Well, we don't see that anywhere here on the flow chart. So maybe that's a different idea, but we're gonna be focused on what's in front of us. So not grow a garden. Get a better job. Again, that's not in the flow chart. Nope. Buy a recipe book. We don't see that in the flow chart. Find food in the kitchen. Okay, so we saw we were looking for an answer with kitchen and there it is, we found it. A blank would be most helpful for showing how many units of various products a business has sold. So what kind of graphic is, if we have multiple products, we want to show how many we've sold. So diagram. Diagram is very general. It's really an illustration of something. So it's comparing units with that. Um, it's, it's probably not the best option. Can we eliminate it right away? Maybe not. Let's look what else we have. So pie chart. So pie chart is when we have a whole and we break it down by parts or percentages. And here we don't really have a whole because we're looking at various products. So we're looking at different products, not one whole break broken up into pieces. Bar graph. Okay, very good. So we'll have different rectangles that represent maybe we sold two red shirts, five black shirts, eight white shirts. So that could be something that's really good for different products. Flow chart. Well, flow chart is what we just saw with a sequence, an order of events, step one, step two, step three. That's not connected to different products. So let's go with our bar graph. Read the sentences below. My tame wolf is not a danger to humans. Despite her size and alarming appearance, she is basically a big, warm-hearted puppy. 
All right. What is the function of an of the underlying transition word in sentence two? So let's see the underlying word, despite. So if you've been studying your transition words, you might have an idea, but let's go through the answers just to be sure. To express a contrast. So yes, this is what despite does. So we say despite her size, she's very big, and alarming or scary appearance, she is a warm-hearted puppy. So we have this contrast. Despite the fact that I like chocolate, I don't like white chocolate. So we always have a contrast, one positive, one negative. So she's really big and scary, but she's like a little puppy. Contrast. We could look at the other ones. We're pretty sure it's number one, but to provide an example. Well, we don't have an example of her size or her being a puppy. We don't have an example like she likes to play fetch like a puppy. We don't have an example. To add emphasis to a point, well, we're not emphasizing how big and scary she is. We're actually contrasting. She's big and scary, but she's like a puppy. So we're not stressing how big she is. We're not emphasizing it. To indicate time or sequence. So we're not saying, oh, first she looked like a puppy and then she was scary. So despite is not a time word here. Let's go with contrast. Despite for contrast. Some more transitions here. Read the sentences below. Shaniqua shows clearly that she is driven to succeed as a student. Blank, I have often noticed her waiting outside the library before it opens at 6 a.m. Blank, her teachers report that she frequently asks for help outside of class. Which words or phrases should be inserted into the blanks to provide clear transitions between these ideas? So would we say, let's plug them in and see how it looks. Shaniqua shows clearly that she is driven to succeed as a student. In conclusion, I have often noticed her waiting outside the library before it opens at 6 a.m. Well, already that first one doesn't work because we're not concluding. We're not even at the end yet, so we're not going to say that. It's, it's, it's proof that she's a good student. It's not the conclusion or the summary. Eliminate that first one. Okay, Shaniqua shows clearly that she is driven to succeed as a student, First, I have often noticed her waiting outside the library before it opens at 6 a.m. Okay, all right, that, that, that can work. Consequently, her teachers report that she frequently asks for help outside of class. So consequently is about a cause and effect, about the result of something. So consequently would be more like if we said, oh, she studies all day at the library. Consequently, she does really well in her tests because of all her time studying. Here, this is not a consequence. Her being at the library, her being with the teachers is not a cause and effect. Next one. Shaniqua shows clearly that she is driven to succeed as a student. Although I have noticed, I have often noticed her waiting outside the library before it opens at 6 a.m. In contrast, her teachers report that she frequently asks for help. So here we have two contrast words, although which is a contrast word, in contrast, of course, is a contrast phrase. And they don't work here because the paragraph is all on the same theme. It's all proving the same thing, that Shanique was working really hard. She's a great student. She's studying hard. So we don't have any contrasts. All of these are on the same side, that she's a great student. Get rid of that. So Shaniqua shows clearly that she is driven to succeed as a student. For instance, I have often noticed her waiting outside the library before it opens at 6 a.m. Okay, for instance, an example of her drive, how hard she works. Furthermore, her teachers report that she frequently asks for help outside of class. So that furthermore is a lot better because it's not a contrast. We're emphasizing, we're giving extra proof of the same idea that she's a great student. So let's go with that one. Next, the tone of a text is... A word or phrase that links ideas? Well, tone is all over a text, so it's not a single word or phrase. No, no, no. The reader's emotional response? Well, the tone can create the emotional response. So if we have a scary tone in the passage, like an Edgar Allan Poe scary, mysterious tone, the reader could be scared. But the tone belongs to the passage and what the author did, not the reader's response. So let's get rid of that. A structural pattern in a series of words. Tone is not a specific pattern. There can be a lot of different elements of tone. It's what verbs you choose to use, what transitions you use. Is the language really formal or really relaxed? Is it really funny? Are you making jokes? So it's not a specific pattern. Cross that out. 
the author's attitude towards the subject. So that's more what we were talking about. If they're having fun with the subject, they're making jokes about it versus if the tone is very formal and they're saying, may I discuss this with you? That's a different tone. So it's how the author approaches the subject, their attitude. The tone of a text is blank if the words say the opposite of what they really mean. So ironic, well, actually, the, this is the, the answer here. We will check to be sure. But ironic is when we're expecting one thing and then something else happens. So if you go to a painter's house and you expect they will have the walls covered in paintings and art, and they don't have any art in their house, you're thinking, oh, but you're an artist, you have no art, that's the opposite of what I would expect. So that would be ironic. The next one, earnest. So earnest is the opposite of ironic. So earnest means you say what you mean, you're honest, you're sincere. So it's not the opposite of what you mean. Confused, I guess it's confusing or you are confused if you say the opposite of what you mean, but Ironic is something that's done with a purpose by authors. We'll see this in some examples on this test, but they use the opposite to, to have an effect on readers, to surprise them or often to be funny. So they're not confused. They're choosing the opposite words on purpose. Unambiguous. So unambiguous means it's really clear. So if the words are the opposite of what they really mean, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be very clear. So let's go with ironic. Read the passage below and answer the following question. A bit of a long passage here, but let's stick with it. We're pushing through. We're getting really close to the end of the test, so I think you've done a great job and we can finish off strong. When Dr. Kingston Hussein saw an announcement for a conference titled Ethics of Human Embryonic Research, he booked his ticket six months in advance. We need to stop and reflect on the ramifications of every new development in our research, said Dr. Hussein, the lead researcher in embryology at the Damson Crockett Institute in Lewiston, Maine. Every researcher in our field feels the weight of responsibility here. It's what we talk about when we go out for drinks after work. Attitudes like Hussein's stand in stark contrast to common public perceptions of embryonic research. These guys think they're gods, said Liz Good, chairwoman of the a center for Ethical and Dignified Humanity, an organization that opposes all research on human embryos. They want to get rich selling designer babies to billionaires. It's a nightmare. An outside observer might expect a researcher like Dr. Hussein to avoid all contact with an activist like Good. On the contrary, Dr. Hussein wrote to the organizers of the conference and requested that they invite Good to host a panel. We need dialogue, he said. We need to hear what makes the public uncomfortable, he chuckled. We also need to inform them about what we're actually doing. And what are the embryonic researchers doing? Not building designer babies, he said. Dr. Hussein uses words like run-of-the-mill medical to describe his research goals. For instance, he is seeking causes and treatments for a variety of neurological disorders. Which adjective most accurately describes the author's tone? So again, tone was what words they choose. Is it very formal? Is it funny? Is it relaxed? Let's, let's look at our options here. Scathing. So what does scathing mean? Scathing is really negative. It's very critical. It's attacking someone else. We don't see that here from the author. I mean, we do see, for example, Liz Good. She's saying these guys think they're gods. Maybe her tone is scathing, but she's not the author. We need the author's tone. It's not scathing. Very critical objective. So the author shows both sides of the doctor and the chairwoman. And the, the author really just reports what they, what they say without taking a stand, you know, themselves. So I think objective is a good option here. There's no particular strong opinion from the author. Negative. Well, again, we see both sides of an issue. We just report what these two people, how they approach the issue. So it's not negative. And ironic, so is there something that's the opposite of what we expect? No, we have a doctor doing research, that's what we expect. A chairwoman sharing their opinion, that's also what we expect. So there's nothing unexpected here. So let's go with objective. We see both sides of the story and the author does not give a lot of descriptive opinions, um, good or bad. Same passage here. Reread the following quotation from the passage. Every researcher in our field feels the weight of responsibility here. It's what we talk about when we go out for drinks after work. 
which adjective most accurately describes Dr. Hussein's tone? So we have scathing again. Is it very critical? No, I mean, he's talking about his own work and his own discussion, so not criticizing someone else. No. Apathetic. So apathetic means you don't care. You can just picture apathetic. Mm, shrug. I don't care. I don't know. It, it doesn't interest me. I don't care. I have no opinion. So he's not apathetic here. He's saying he feels the weight of responsibility. It's what we talk about. If it's a subject you talk about a lot with your colleagues, you're not apathetic. Earnest. So earnest means you're sincere and you're honest. So he's saying, I feel responsible. This is what I talk about with my colleagues. It sounds really earnest. Yeah. Ironic. The opposite of what you expect. Well, a doctor who's a researcher and they take their job seriously, that is what I expect. I think that's what most of us expect. I think it would be very strange to be a doctor and to be working on a subject that, that you don't take seriously, that you don't feel responsible for. That would be ironic. But here, it's very consistent with our expectations. So we're going to go with earnest. On to our next one. Reread a different following quotation from the passage. These guys think they're gods. They want to get rich selling designer babies to billionaires. It's a nightmare. Okay, a different, different tone here. Which adjective most accurately describes Liz Good's tone? Harsh. So harsh is very severe. Um, again, criticizing someone. So harsh is, whoa, that was very harsh. So that, that could work here. I mean, saying that they think they're gods, they're selling babies. That's a very harsh idea. It's a nightmare. Very strong language here. Tolerant. Ooh, I wouldn't say calling someone, saying that a situation is a nightmare, that's not tolerant, or saying someone thinks they're a god, that's not tolerant of these people. No, no, no. Earnest. So earnest, I mean, maybe this is how she feels, but it's not really her talking honestly and sincerely about her experience. She's kind of throwing accusations at someone else, and maybe she doesn't really know what they're really feeling. So this is not earnest like the doctor talking about his own responsibility. Ironic, is this the opposite of what we expect? So it's it's not exactly the opposite of what we expect. I mean, maybe you could say doctors should be ethical, so they shouldn't be selling designer babies, but we don't really have the, the truth behind that. So this is really about her tone, and her tone is very harsh. She's accusing someone else of something and saying it's a nightmare. Her words are very, very severe, very critical, very harsh. Which phrase functions as a transition to juxtapose dissimilar ideas in the passage? So juxtapose is to hold something up, show how they are different. So which phrase here is a transition to juxtapose, to contrast? Dissimilar ideas, different ideas. Attitudes like Dr. Hussein, so let's look for that in the passage. Attitudes like Dr. Hussein stand in stark contrast. Well, we do have contrast the word, but that's not in the phrase. So maybe it's not the best. That sentence shows a contrast, but mm, let's look at the others just in case. For instance, so for instance, in general, it's not a contrast transition, but let's try to find it in here. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Do we see for instance? For instance, at the, at the bottom here, describe his research goals. For instance, he is seeking cure for neurological disorders. So he's saying run of the mill. His research is very standard medical research. For instance, he's looking for um, treatment for a disease. So this is not a contrast. It's actually an example of what he's doing. So for instance, not contrast. An outside observer. So an outside observer might expect Dr. Hussein to avoid all contact. Well, after this, we see some contrast, which is a bit of a spoiler for the answer. But an outside observer, that's not the phrase that shows contrast. Mm, on the contrary, sounds like a contrast phrase. Let's find it. It was right after that might expect Dr. Hussein to avoid all contact. On the contrary, he wrote to the organizers and asked them to invite her. So on the contrary, the opposite, it's a contrast, it's juxtaposed, we see a difference. So on the contrary.
So we are done then. All right. Excellent work. So great job staying with me, going through all those passages, all those questions and answers. We reviewed some great topics like the, the main topic, the topic sentence, evaluating sources, primary, secondary. Now you know which areas are stronger and which ones you might need to study a little bit. So don't forget to go to the free link in the description below, you can take a full practice test, all the sections. And you should also take a look at our other resources like our self-paced study course or our study group if you wanna be in a group with others. We have a lot of HESI resources, so subscribe for more HESI content and great work today. Good luck on the test.